So have you ever wondered why Ragnarok was such a drastic style change compared to the first two movies? Well, this movie. This movie was why. I don't know if I would say this movie was bad compared to just normal films, but compared to the rest of the MCU, this was definitely a weak point. Some have even argued that Florida Dark World is arguably the worst movie in the entirety of the MCU. And to be honest, I can kind of see why. There's just really nothing that special about it. This movie didn't really do much of anything for anyone outside of Loki, and I, I, the villain was lame, the plot was pretty basic, and it was basically like, hey, let's just make a movie to give Thor something to do, not to really advance much of anything. And it's a shame too, because Mythological Thor can be done well, that was proven in the first movie. This movie unfortunately couldn't really capitalize off that and keep the momentum, which again is why the style of the character and of the movies in themselves were shifted so drastically going into the third film. The basic plot of this movie is Thor's trying to unite the Nine Realms and then these evil elves that used to be there before come back to life and they try to fuck shit up and Thor reunites with Jane and Jane's got this red shit tied inside of her and it's, you know, it's probably better if I just show you. So let's take a look back at what might be the worst movie in the MCU, Thor The Dark World. So basically this movie starts in a flashback of an ancient war between the Dark Elves and the Asgardians. The Dark Elves leader Malekith is trying to use this ancient thing called the Aether to take over the world, but the Asgardians just come in, whoop that ass, and then take the Aether from him, and they hide it as Malekith flees. So we then pick up pretty much immediately after the events of the Avengers and Loki is back on Asgard and he's being sentenced by Odin for his crimes on Earth. Basically his mother Frigga is the only reason he's not going to be killed and he will instead serve the rest of his time in the dungeons. So meanwhile Thor, Sif, and the warriors are just fighting some random dudes. This is a pretty basic fight scene setup, I'm sure you've seen this before. There's some basic enemies and Thor just beats them up but then uh oh here comes a bigger enemy, surely he's gonna be too much and then he's fucking not. Thor returns to Asgard and he's still pretty beat up about not being able to see Jane and Odin basically just says bro just get over it you're gonna be king and shit just find yourself another woman. Speaking of other women, Sif tries to hit on him and he like very politely rejects her like it was a real smooth polite rejection but I mean I guess he at least he was nice about it. So meanwhile back on Earth Jane Foster is on a blind date with Chris O'Dowd who plays Roy from the IT crowd very random cameo there but they're interrupted by Darcy who's like, yo, your detector thing has found something. So they, along with Darcy's new intern, drive to this site where they meet up with some kids who found a truck that's freaking levitating. Pretty sure trucks aren't supposed to do that. They also find some kind of weird portal and turns out when you drop something through it, it comes out through the top of the sky, except it doesn't always. Sometimes it stays up there. So Jane leaves the others behind to go explore the building more and ends up getting sucked into an alternate world where conveniently the ether is located and the ether is like, hey yo, gonna host your body now and it does just that, latching itself inside of her. That's not all it does though, as meanwhile in the Legion of Doom, Malekith and the Dark Elves are awakened by the Aether being awoken. By the way, Malekith is played by Kristoff Elkinson, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that. Back at Asgard, Thor meets up with Heimdall, the Guardian of the Bridge, who teaches him about the upcoming convergence of the Nine Realms. Turns out Thor has been using Heimdall's all-seeing abilities to check on Jane, but when Heimdall tries to see her, for some reason, he cannot locate her this time. The reason for that is Jane is still in this alternate universe where the Aether is fully engrossed itself inside of her. Jane wakes up like five hours later and meets up with Darcy who calls the police. They're about to be arrested but luckily the God of Thunder has returned to check on her. Jane goes to talk to the police but after one of them try to grab her arm, the Aether attacks and just explodes out of nowhere. Thor immediately recognizes that something is majorly wrong and decides to take Jane back with him to Asgard. Meanwhile, Malekith along with his bitch Algrim have returned to their old destroyed homeland and he vows to get revenge on the Asgardians. Jane is being studied by the doctors on Asgard, but Odin arrives and is not exactly happy that she's been sent there. After the Aether attacks again, Odin, Jane, and Thor go to the ancient library to see what it just might be. They read some ancient book that conveniently tells them exactly what it is, but unfortunately, they don't quite know how to get it out of Jane. Malekith sets his plan fervor into motion meanwhile by turning Algrim into something called a Cursed. Algrim is able to easily gain entrance to Asgard meanwhile, as he gets intentionally arrested and locked up in the prison. That happens to be the same prison where Loki is being held up, who's having a tense conversation with his mother Frigga. Out of anger, he says that Frigga isn't his real mother, which he instantly regrets, showing that Loki actually does care for somebody. 
Okay, so I gotta talk about this next scene. So it's a romantic scene between Four and Jane, and they're just kissing and shit before they meet Frigga. But right before any of that happens, right? So Four touches her. He touches her on the arm, he touches her when he kisses her, and the Aether does not attack. Why does the Aether not attack when he touches her? It can be for one of two reasons. Either A, it's just a major plot hole, or B, the quote-unquote explanation is that, oh, what only attacks when Jane is touched aggressively. If that's the explanation, it's stupid. If not, it's a plot hole. Either way, it's stupid. Back in the prison, Algrim unleashes his full power, easily breaks out of his cell, kills pretty much all the guards, and frees all of the prisoners, except for Loki, because he's not a complete idiot. Four and friends go down there to fight them off, while Friga stays with Jane. There's more problems going on though, as an invisible ship is approaching. Luckily, Heimdall can see all, and he's able to cut it down, and there's no more, ah oh, shit, there's a lot more invisible ships. But don't worry, those ships won't make it in, as Heimdall's able to activate the fortress wall, which protects Asgard and oh looks like Algrim found the alternate route which shuts down the fortress wall that's unfortunate and seizing this golden opportunity one of the ships basically just kamikazes its way right into Asgard's main palace multiple dark elves make their way out of the ship and holy shit they got like interdimensional grenades or some shit Malekith's in there too and he uses one of those grenades to completely destroy Odin's throne Malekith then makes his way into Frigga's chamber and they do battle Frigga actually gains the upper hand on him until Algrim comes in and restrains her. Malekith then sees Jane and goes to extract the Aether, but turns out she was just an illusion. He demands Frigga tell her where she actually is, but she refuses, so he decides to kill her. Thor comes in just too late to save her, but not too late to burn off half of Malekith's face. Thor knocks Malekith and Algrim off the balcony, but luckily there's a conveniently placed ship there and they're able to escape. So they mourn Frigga's death and they have this big ass pretty cool funeral for her. Loki is also informed and he expresses his rage in a different way. Back on Earth, Dr. Eric Selvig looks to be teaching a class about what's going on with the Nine Realms, but turns out he's not really teaching a class, he's in an insane asylum with Stan Lee. So Odin basically then has Jane taken prisoner and locked up because she has the ether inside of her, and Thor obviously does not take well this and, and confronts him about it, and he demands to go after Malekith, but Odin's like, nah, he'll just come to us, it'll be fine, even though Asgard is literally defenseless because half the castle is destroyed and their shields are down. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Darcy is trying to get in touch with Eric, but her intern Ian sees on the news that Eric was arrested at Stonehenge while running around naked. Back on Asgard, meanwhile, Thor is running out options and him, Heimdall, Sif, and the warriors start a plan of treason. Thor confronts a distraught Loki and offers him a deal of vengeance. He will free Loki from his cell if Loki helps him escape Asgard along with Jane. He also stresses to Loki though that he has no desire to protect him anymore and if Loki attempts to betray him even once, he will kill him. Also, I should probably mention this next scene because it's like the only funny scene in the whole movie. They're just walking down a hallway and Loki keeps shape-shifting into different forms, including Chris Evans as Captain America, and it's pretty funny, and I'm sad to say that it's really the only scene in this whole movie that legitimately made me laugh. So after Heimdall distracts Odin and Sif and the warriors fight off the guards, Thor, Loki, and Jane make their way onto the Dark Elf ship and fly it out of Asgard. Their ship is almost shot down, but they're able to jump out of that ship onto a smaller vessel, which Loki uses to guide them through a secret portal, which takes them to the Dark Elf homeworld. Unfortunately for them, a now half-burnt-faced Malekith has seen them coming, as he senses that the Aether has returned home. As Jane sleeps, Loki and Thor have somewhat of a brotherly fight, where Thor expresses at the end that he wishes he could trust Loki, and Loki responds with probably the most badass line in the entire movie, telling Thor to trust his rage. So back in London, Darcy and Ian are able to get Eric out of the mental hospital, and they see some birds go for one of those anti-gravity portals, and then they come up from below them, scaring the shit out of them, but it puts Eric Eric at ease because he realizes the world is crazier than he is and he throws away his pills. So Thor and Loki meanwhile go to confront Malekith but Loki after he gets the handcuffs taken off seemingly turns on Thor and stabs him for the heart and then cuts his hand off. He then offers up Jane as a sacrifice to Malekith who extracts the ether out of her. Turns out it was all a ruse though and Thor uses this opportunity to try to destroy the ether. Unfortunately for them though, the Aether don't quite destroy that easy, and it reforms and then goes back inside of Malekith. So Malekith escapes while Thor does battle with Algrim who just kicks his ass until Loki stabs him for the heart of the sword. 
Algrim in turn though then stabs Loki for the heart with the same sword, but luckily Loki attached one of those grenades onto him, destroying Algrim. Loki then unfortunately dies from his wounds, and to make matters worse, a giant sandstorm comes, forcing Jane and Thor to take shelter. Something interesting happens though, after Chris O'Dowd calls her, Jane realizes that she has cell service, and inside the cave she also finds all the things that they threw for the portal earlier in the movie. They walk a little bit more for the cave, and just like that, they're back in London. So they reunite with Darcy, Ian, and Eric, and Eric is able to determine that Malekith is probably going to use the Nine Realms by going to the main point, which happens to be located in Greenwich. So they go to Greenwich and they set up these devices that for some reason are going to allow them to control the portals. It's only supposed to be used to detect anomalies, but for whatever reason they don't actually explain it, they can suddenly use them to control the universe. So I, whatever the fuck I guess. Malekith and his Dark Elves arrive as well, and he begins to do battle with Thor. Through the portals they fight into multiple dimensions including Malekith's homeworld, and also Jotunheim, in which they accidentally unleash a frost beast into Greenwich. One portal separates them though as Thor goes back into a subway which he has to take back to Greenwich, while Malekith goes right back into Greenwich. Malekith begins to use the full power of the ether to take over the world, but luckily Thor is like, hey don't worry, these little stick things that for some reason can control space and time, I'll just defeat you with these, and that's exactly what he does, he just fucking throws them at him, and like uses it to transport different parts of him, to other dimensions, and Malekith is defeated and stuff. Thor is passed out though, and Malekith's ship's about to fall on him, but luckily, the ship goes through another portal, and just crushes Malekith back in his homeworld. So then a couple days later, Jane, Darcy, Eric, and Ian are all having breakfast, and Thor has gone back to Asgard, where Odin offers him the throne. Thor refuses though, choosing to be a guardian protector. Odin understands, but turns out it's not really Odin, it's Loki in disguise. So there's a mid credit scene and an end credit scene. In the mid credit scene, Sif and Volstagg visit the Collector and give him possession of the Aether, as turns out the Aether is an Infinity Stone, and it is unwise to keep the Aether near the Tesseract, which is also an Infinity Stone. The, also then the Collector then ominously says one down, five to go, like he's gonna be some kind of major villain in the future, even though he's fucking not. In the post credit scene, meanwhile, Thor goes back to Earth and reunites with Jane, but meanwhile that frost monster they let in is still running around the city. So obviously this was not one of the stronger MCU movies, but was it the weakest? Well, let's pull up the MCU big board and find out. So really this is a question to me of is this worse than The Incredible Hulk? And even though The Incredible Hulk is arguably not even canon anymore, has some poor acting, some poor CGI, you know what I can say about The Incredible Hulk that I can't say about this movie? The Incredible Hulk, despite all its faults, is not boring. This movie at multiple points is boring. It's boring, it's kind of pointless, it doesn't really feel like it needs to exist, so am I gonna put this movie lower than, than The Incredible Hulk? Yeah, I am. I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, but now that I think about it, it, it I, yeah, I had to do it to him. I just had to do it to him. I had to put this last. So, with that being said then, here is where we now stand. We have The Avengers, number one, Iron Man, number two, Captain America, the first Avenger, number three, Thor, number four, Iron Man three, number five, Iron Man two, number six, Hulk, number seven, and Thor The Dark World, number eight. Now this is gonna sound really harsh, but you know what you would be better off doing than watching this movie? You're probably better off just going into YouTube and typing up Thor The Dark World Loki Scenes Compilation, because Loki was pretty much the best part of this whole movie. Not only that, but he's really the only one that this movie did anything for. This movie established two major plot points going forward, just two. One, that the Aether is an Infinity Stone, okay fair enough, and two, it signified that Loki actually does have a heart, 
and it hinted at his eventual good guy turn later on in the MCU. But this movie really did nothing for Thor as a character. Again, it was just to give him something to do. Jane and friends don't even return in the next movie, and that's probably for the best. And as previously mentioned, the next movie is a major stylistic change. Ragnarok was hilarious, it was a hell of a lot better than this, and it was what was needed to save the Thor franchise. And to be honest, other than that, I really don't have much to say about this movie, because, I mean, why would I? This movie really didn't provide us with much in general. And I know what you might be thinking, Phase 2 of the MCU is off to a little bit of a rough start. We had Iron Man 3, which was good up until that stupid-ass plot twist, and now we got this boring-ass movie, so it can't get worse, right? Well, you're right, it's actually going to get a hell of a lot better, as up next is one of the best, arguably top five movie in the entirety of the MCU, Captain America The Winter Soldier. And next week on Free 16 Reviews, we will be switching styles drastically as we go from the MCU back to horror as we return to the Saw franchise with Saw 2. But in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, you're probably better off just giving this movie a skip. This movie is going to be in my last spot on the MCU big board for a while, and to be honest, maybe permanently. I don't necessarily think there's a bad movie in the entirety of the MCU, but if I had to pick a weakest movie, it's probably this. But ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for my look back at Thor The Dark World. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, all my social media links are down in the description down below. Thank you to all 47 of my patrons for supporting me and both my channels. But I'll see you guys next week, next Saturday for Saw 2. With all that being said, my name is Taffrey Steen. This has been my MCU look back at Thor The Dark World, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.